I've always been pretty vocal about my dissatisfaction with Mass Effect Andromeda. A game that arrived in the shadow of the Mass Effect trilogy was always going to struggle to live up to the atmosphere, the quality and characters among many other incredible things. However, there were many reasons why Mass Effect Andromeda didn't sit right with me, and I also realised I've never gone into depth about what I think about this game. It's always been brief sub points I've mentioned on my way to making other points about the Mass Effect trilogy, and so I thought instead I'd replay Andromeda, hit record and do a video actually going into depth on why I think this game is disconnected from what Mass Effect is. And while I realised the initial intent of my second playthrough, I also found myself with an appreciation for some of the things that the game does do. So don't expect this video to be all negative. I don't want this to come across as some form of review for a three year old game because nobody wants that, least of all me. This video is simply a critique piece talking about where the game went right and where the game went wrong in the grand scheme of Mass Effect as a brand and how we could see it shift forward from here. And since this is still the latest Mass Effect title, I guess it has some relevance. And so here's my video on Mass Effect Andromeda, a game intergalactically disconnected from its predecessors. Who am I kidding, that quirky title probably doesn't make any sense. Roll the intro. Andromeda launched in March of 2017. It was bold in its contents, that being it took us away from the much beloved world building of the Milky Way galaxy, 2.5 million light years across dark space on a one way trip to a cluster of solar systems somewhere completely new and unexplored. This is very in keeping with the sense of adventure and exploration that makes Mass Effect so compelling, but we'll get more onto that front as we go through the video. Mass Effect Andromeda launched in 2017 in a state that can only be described in hindsight as pitiful. Glitches and bugs were rife and fans were disappointed. It is safe to say that this game did not achieve its desired effect. First time around it was pretty difficult to see past the issues that played the launch, but the benefit of it now being 2020 is the game is now patched and much more playable from that angle. Now we can see the game for what it is, a game as opposed to a hot mess. Even now it's far from the tidiest experience ever, but I certainly think it was worth the second playthrough just to get a feel for how Bioware and EA left this game. To summarise the state that the game finds itself in these days, well, my face is tired from dealing with everything. Addison's face is still tired. <laughs> my face is tired. Somebody sat down and wrote that for this character. I'm sorry, I could never get over that line of dialogue. It's so bad. To be fair, the bugs are much less absurd now, but the game's still far from the most polished thing to ever grace the universe. I'm sure I'll get into more detail on that front later. As for the faces, the human faces especially still have a strong case of the Mass Effect Andromeda. Jesus Christ, Cora, how much cocaine did you do? Anyway, let's not get too carried away with that just yet. Mass Effect Andromeda was a new adventure in a much beloved universe that presented an exciting new prospect and gave us as the player the responsibility of achieving it through our new protagonist, Ryder. And it's safe to say that come 2017 plenty of players were ready for a new Mass Effect experience.
As I said, Andromeda wasn't received as well as Bioware and EA had hoped. First and foremost, it was obvious that Andromeda was a game designed to continue the Mass Effect brand without having to canonise an ending to 3 or explain what happened after the ending of the much beloved trilogy. It's the easy way out because they'd snookered themselves with the Mass Effect 3 ending so hard that no matter what they did afterwards it would upset somebody somewhere. If you're familiar with the ending of Mass Effect 3 then you know just how sticky that situation was for Bioware. Suffice it to say I didn't envy them. The answer was to shift Mass Effect to a new galaxy and tell a completely new story story with no overlapping characters and goal whatsoever. Of course, there's the little mention of the trilogy's events in Mass Effect Andromeda due to the Reapers not being common knowledge until 3, which is set after the Andromeda Initiative embarked on an adventure to a new galaxy. So why there's this disconnect is explained in a way that does make some kind of sense. To put it simply, that's all well and good, but it does sever the narrative in a way that allows Andromeda to throw potential fan service, for example, straight out the window. I'm not saying that the game lacks fan service, I'm saying the fan service that's there is slapped in afterwards because the main purpose of this game is to avoid the plot responsibilities left in wake of the trilogy. The idea of exploring uncharted worlds in a new galaxy is a fun concept for Mass Effect that I'm not mad at in itself, but a lot of fans including myself felt like this was done not because it was a fun concept, but to put the rest of the brand at arm's length. The game doesn't pretend that the trilogy never happened, however, as you can find some of Alec Ryder's memories that feed you little bits of information, there's a few audio calls from Liara to Sony, you can watch one of Alec Ryder's memories where he's speaking to Garrus's father, where you learn a little bit about the Reapers, as well as a brief mention of Commander Shepard, but to access these you have to go seriously out of your way. I kinda like having a reason to explore, but I still feel like this connection is kinda loose. There are many ways you can address a continuation of the Mass Effect universe without speeding away from all the inconveniences inclusive plot responsibilities. I agree that not every single detail needs addressing, but it's pretty obvious that Andromeda was running away from the fans' biggest questions just the same. And fans noticed. Andromeda is a new environment to explore, a new galaxy actually, well, no, it's not, not quite anyway. It's a cluster in the Andromeda galaxy consisting of a lot of star systems that all conveniently host life. <laughs> we're not exploring across Andromeda realistically are we, we're just in the Helios cluster. So here's one of the first pitfalls of Andromeda, we'd be able to explore all of it were it not restricted by a cool in-game pseudoscience concept of Mass Effect that lends the franchise its name. Longer distance space travel requires mass relays, it really would not make sense if Andromeda Andromeda had mass relays, would it? Anywho, there is a novelty to exploring these new worlds, however it quickly loses that novelty when you realise it's nowhere near as rich in lore and mystery as the Milky Way was. How could this game have ever lived up to that realistically? What sold me on Mass Effect as a universe is the believability of the Milky Way galaxy. It's sprawling with life, alien and human, organic and artificial, political structures, different cultures, different histories, and it's all presented in a way that makes you feel as if this world is alive and has existed outside the confines of the game. Of course, exploring Andromeda was going to feel lonely by comparison, because the entire point is we're doing the world building in this game, whereas in the trilogy it was already pre-established. And while Andromeda isn't without Andromeda lore, that being the Angara, the Remnant and the Ket, it's all very bare and rarely is it interesting. Why? Because especially when compared to the trilogy, none of it feels real. As I was playing through Andromeda at many moments, I found myself going, I wonder what's going on in the Milky Way right now, as opposed to being interested in any Ket, Angara or Remnant lore. The Ket lore is presented pretty touch and go, maybe you'll find some data pads but nothing really gave me an idea of what they were doing beyond making more Ket for the sake of it, I guess. As main antagonists for the game, there's no word to describe them other than awful. They're boring and have no mystery about them whatsoever. The only question I ever found myself asking about them is why on earth are they named after Horse Tranquilizer? The remnant of this game's Prothean stand-in, an ancient race that has since vanished, only leaving their technology behind. Their structures are all very samey, with some cool advanced technology that makes the modern civilizations of the Mass Effect universe look like the discovery of fire. But I couldn't stop myself from thinking that an ancient advanced race is a story that we've seen told before in Mass Effect, and as a result it's lost lost interest based on the fact that it's not original. But credit where credit's due, this is history and world building for the Andromeda Galaxy, which is important here. I understand and appreciate why they had to exist, but did they need to be a main focus of the story? 
Perhaps not. The Angara, on the other hand, are interesting. They're a civil culture that functions as an anchor to Andromeda, so we're not there with no welcoming new faces. Some Angara give trust easily, but others make you work for it. Some are stuck in their ways and become our adversaries, but the Angara on the whole are not hostile towards us, and without the Angara I think there'd be no point even bothering in trying to settle in Andromeda. Learning about their ways and how they differ from the other pre-established races was great fun. They have a culture of their own and their own mannerisms in how they present themselves, but but even still, compared to the races of the Milky Way that we learnt about over the course of the trilogy, they feel a little bit artificial. That being said, it's a cool dynamic that our presence in Andromeda puts a strain on their culture. I just think even that required more fleshing out than it perhaps got. The rest of the world building is put upon us. It's our objective as the player to settle the Milky Way races in Andromeda, and honestly it didn't have the same charm as having a strong pre-established galaxy for us to experience. It is different and I can't knock it for that, but something felt missing. It felt lonely, especially when compared to the feelings I got from the trilogy. And you're probably thinking maybe that's by design, and of course I agree with that, I think it was by design, but also, the delivery made me want to go back as opposed to forward. Of course the Milky Way isn't forgotten in Andromeda, bits of lore and information are dotted throughout with some vagueish references to the trilogy, Commander Shepard and the Reapers thrown in there too. Nothing too deep, but they don't want to canonise any decisions, Shepard's gender, personality or the ending of Mass Effect 3, not to mention any of the many choices that you can make over the course of the trilogy, so I guess from the perspective of the game being a cop-out that was expected. But I will say this, it's comforting to feel like this takes place in at least the same universe as the trilogy, if not the same galaxy. On the whole, the world building was never going to satisfy was it? So much to build up in place of stuff that was more easily established in the initial Milky Way setting. Who knows, maybe an Andromeda sequel will provide us with more, maybe this is not the complete picture, but if I compare it to the feeling of the world building from Mass Effect 1 alone, Andromeda still felt wanting. So I feel this criticism is valid. Irrespective of the world building, however, exploring this new galaxy was great fun. I don't, however, feel as if there was enough to explore. We had a few planets we could land on and experience an open world area, and there was the occasional mission that took us somewhere fresh and new, but I don't feel like the scope of exploring a new galaxy is realised in this game, which was a bit of a shame considering it was practically the game's selling point. There are a lot of solar systems in the Helios Cluster for us to go and take a look at, but the vast majority don't really have much going on at all besides from finding materials. The trilogy can be guilty of this at times as well, and honestly it's a shame that it didn't get improved here. Ultimately it's great fun to have an adventure in a new galaxy and explore the prospect of what's beyond the Milky Way in the Mass Effect universe, but the downplay world building and at times unoriginal concepts make the entire point of this game just feel neutered. But behind all that there is a great concept that can still be explored in a sequel to Andromeda, but whether or not that will actually happen considering the response that this game did get from fans and new players alike is now naturally anyone's guess. After this and then Anthem, <coughs> Bioware will likely want to play it safe, and so as big a shame as it would be, I believe that the Andromeda Initiative is more than likely dead in the water, but I'd love to be wrong, because even where this idea lacked execution, it had potential. Obviously in this game we do not play as Commander Shepard again, wouldn't that just be daft? No, in this game we have Pathfinder Rider. We can choose to play as either male or female Rider, both of whom have default appearances, that for male Rider is fine but female Rider is a horror show, and default names, that being Scott and Sarah. You can change the name of whichever you choose, so I chose Scott because he has a hard on the eyes scraggly bum fluff beard but he needs to be a badass Pathfinder to make up for it, and I kept the default name because characters will actually use it. I didn't want to customise Rider because I knew that the end result would be an absolute abortion of a character and I can't deal with that while trying to take this game seriously. You can however customise the appearance of both Ryder twins regardless of which one you choose and the results will have an effect on how Alec Ryder their father looks as well. On top of this the Ryder twins have different backstories. Scott used to be a guard on a mass relay whereas Sarah was a Prothean researcher and so they have slightly different backgrounds and while it doesn't matter if you choose one or the other they do the same stuff, they don't swap their basic background character traits just because you choose one over the other. I think it's really cool that if you keep Ryder's default first name it's used in the game. It's hardly Fallout 4 Codsworth where you can choose a handful of names and have it get used, my personal favourite of which being Fuckface. Mr. Fuckface. 
but it's a neat detail nonetheless. However, the flip side of this is Andromeda discouraged personalising Rider. Changing his or her first name would alter interactions to avoid using it, and facial customization was a minefield of disasters, so the safest option wound up being to remain with the default. Before we become Pathfinder Rider, however, we're working for Pathfinder Rider. Ryder's father, Alec Ryder, portrayed by Clancy Brown, you may know him as Mr. Krabs. The relationship between Mr. Krabs and his children is a bit of a weird one. The Riders aren't exactly a functional family, but we don't get to see the full extent of that, nor do we get to see it get fixed between these characters because within the first hour, Alec Ryder dies. In the most ridiculous way ever imaginable. Scott's helmet is broken so Alec gives Scott his. Why don't they share it? No one knows. We can clearly see that while the gases on the planet aren't breathable, they are at least not toxic, so they could in theory share the helmet, however no. Alec instead accepts an avoidable death and uploads the Sam node to whichever Rider twin we're deciding to play as, dying and leaving us with the responsibility of Pathfinder, because responsible is my middle name. Now where do I find me some Asari boobies? After Alec's death, there are moments of brief, vague grief and anger in small quantities, but the entire point is that Alec Rider was a distant man, but it's delivered in a way that makes me feel like the character didn't really care that their father is dead. It's brushed over pretty quickly, one moment it's, I'm sorry Scott, your father's dead, the next it's you're the new Pathfinder and Scott's like, whoa, that's pretty sick. I feel like if you're going to throw in a difficult father-like character, you should at least present these bonds being mended over the course of the game before you kill them. It would A, give us a reason to care and B, not throw away the talent that is Clancy Brown. So as I was saying, Ryder assumes the mantle of their father and becomes Pathfinder for the human arc, which explains why we're doing what we're doing in the game, finding a new home for humanity in Andromeda. I do feel like Ryder as a character is far more on on rails than Commander Shepard. I can't pretend you had the most character moulding power ever seen with Shepard, but Ryder doesn't have your Paragon Renegade roots. A lot of dialogue options boil down to yes I will help and maybe later. Ryder is preset as a bit of a jokey character, somewhat insufferable to others but serious when needed. I think this is designed to be more youthful in feel than Shepard, which I guess would make sense if Ryder wasn't over 600 fucking years old. Anyway, the lack of a Paragon slash Renegade system or morality gating system in any effective capacity allows for you to flip flop between between personalities. Andromeda pretends to resolve this issue by allowing for vaguer character approaches, so Ryder is a set personality where there are just various dialogue choices you can make and they'd all be what Ryder would say. And it isn't bad, but Mass Effect's protagonist direction was founded on the Paragon Renegade system and it's a shame to see it completely gone. Obviously that's a huge part of decision making in Mass Effect so it's just a shame to see that it's lost a bit of identity. Overall, I don't think Ryder is a bad protagonist, I just think that we don't have very much agency as the player to mould him or her to to be our own. Like I said, it's all very on rails as well, so there's no unique experience to have with Ryder that other players may not experience due to a different choice, maybe barring who they decide to romance. About 99% of stuff in this game feels decided for you, and yes you can make diddy decisions every now and then, but they don't have any lasting impact outside of the immediate situation, so really what's the point? The crew you embark on an adventure with is where any Mass Effect game thrives the most. It's not the end you work towards, but the friendships you build along the way. Mass Effect Andromeda is no exception, with its cast of characters being one of its redeeming factors. You and your crew travel across the Helios Cluster aboard the Tempest, your cool new ship. Aboard which, you have a slightly smaller crew than the Normandy vessel from the trilogy, with no inconsequential NPCs littered about the place. Every character has a purpose you explore. While the bustle of having random characters aboard your ship is interesting, in this, you can speak to everyone aboard the Tempest and learn about them as characters. Firstly, you have six squad mates that you can take with you on firefights. Liam is a cool guy, ruled a little by his emotions in certain decisions, such as his loyalty mission, which is one of my favourites in the game. We don't even know if this is the way. Well, something has to go right. You take a risk for the right reason. It's supposed to work. Ugh. You dent your locker, the principal will be pissed. It isn't a joke. I jumped us here blind. We don't know where anyone is or how anything works. And now we're fighting some asshole who wants everyone chained. It's like hitting Andromeda all over again. The shield of Van. Don't make this about the whole initiative. We're here to help, and why am I the one defending your plan? I don't know. I will not be ignored anymore. See? 
Total asshole. Cora has an interesting dynamic. She functions as a sort of second in command character in a sense that she was supposed to be Pathfinder after Alec, but Alec gave it to you instead. She gets over that remarkably quickly, but is respectable as was her design. She, like the other characters, gradually opens up to Ryder as we go. Drac is an old Krogan, and a very nice guy as it turns out, wise at times even but an absolute tank to bring on missions above all else. He's fun to talk to and has that classic Krogan sense of humour, in a lot of ways reminds me of Rex, but isn't quite as fleshed out. Likely due to Rex being present over the course of a whole trilogy and Drac only being in Andromeda. He's a good character comparable to Rex in Mass Effect 1, however. He's the kind of guy that you can get into a bar fight with. You and what army? <laughs> I don't need an army. I've got a Krogan. <laughs> I'm getting too old for this shit. When it comes to PB, what you'll hear other people say depends on who you ask. For some, she's an irritation, but for others, she's okay. I found her to be quite amusing. She's very talkative yet distant from other characters, and her development is presented through her loyalty mission, in which we learn about why she keeps others at arm's length, with us seeing her overcome that with the crew of the Tempest and being a part of this family dynamic. She can be irritating at times, but for the most part, she is a solid, charming character. Could certainly do with not being annoying, but that's kind of, I guess, the character's design. Vetra is our resident Turian. She's a very kind character who functions as something of an example of somebody who can get shit done, to put it simply, which is is presented right away. She knows her worth and has a decent dynamic with her sister which ties into her loyalty mission. Then we have the crew's resident Angara, the new friendly alien on the block, Jarl. Through Jarl we learn a lot about his people and culture. He's a lot more emotionally open than players anticipate and is also very amusing at times when trying but failing to understand the quirks of the Milky Way. He's an interesting character more emotionally attached to the cat antagonists and so he's quite good to have around. Beyond the key squad mates, there are a few other crew members aboard the Tempest. Callow is the pilot of the Tempest. He's a bit of a gossipy character who you can ask what he thinks about the rest of the crew, and he'll give you some details you'd not get simply from asking the crewmates in question. Suvi is a religious character, but is also a scientist, and that's a fascinating combo already. She justifies it well in a way that doesn't disrespect religion or science, and I find that to be a really good thing for those playing the game to understand the greys of the universe. Not everything is black and white. Suvi also gives you information about planets while on the galaxy map. Gil is an engineer aboard the Tempest. He and Callow are often at odds arguing over upgrading the Tempest, which Callow is strongly against, but Gil feels it's necessary. Of course, both have the right to their points, but butt heads over it. We can get involved and help these characters go from being civil adversaries to more accepting of one another, and that's a fun concept. Gil is also somewhat socially awkward as we learn through talking to him, but we can give him advice since his little arc is he wishes to become a father with his friend, who is named Jill. I think they were going for something funny, but that aspect falls flat. But Gil is a good dude, and isn't beyond reason as your expectations may lead you to believe through Callow. Then we have Dr. Lexi Tapero. Lexi is the crew's doctor, she often has concerns for characters' well-beings, mentally and physically, and is just a great addition to the crew. She'll often let you know if she has concerns for any characters, and can often be seen patching up members of your crew. As I said, the crew dynamic is one of the strongest aspects of Mass Effect Andromeda, and I did have a good time getting to know these individuals. My place is an utter mess. Who wants to help me clean it up? Think I left the stove on. I'm making ice. It's an ungodden holiday. Reports don't file themselves. Helping Liam make ice. Unfortunately, the characters quickly run out of things to say, and that can be quite frustrating considering the amount of time that you'll spend on the Tempest in between missions. It's a bit of a drag that the crew will eventually default to just saying the same stuff over and over again, especially when those questions may have answers that could update later on as the story progresses and as the crew gets tighter knit. Best example I can give is when you ask Callow about gossip. Eventually, he'll just wind up saying this over and over again. Anything else in the meantime? What do you think of the rest of the crew? 
No. Oh. <laughs> if I gossip any more, I'll get in trouble. What do you think of the rest of the crew? No. Oh. <laughs> if I gossip any more, I'll get in trouble. What do you think of the rest of the crew? No. Oh. <laughs> if I gossip any more, I'll get in trouble. Say something fucking interesting, you lizard! Of course, crew members will come out with interesting things to say in the openings of dialogue when something integral to the plot happens, and every now and then characters will be up to something that can trigger a little bit of dialogue as well. However, when it comes to talking to these characters for the sake of talking to them in the later stages of the game, they all become quite vapid. When traversing planets in the Nomad, your squad mates will have conversations with one another. It's just a shame that they don't have this much interesting stuff to say aboard the Tempest. Altogether, however, I feel like the characters made for a fun ride. The Tempest has an alright atmosphere when engaging with your crew and gave me straight Normandy vibes. It didn't feel as bustling and the crew wasn't as large, but they were all still cool to get to know. I will say as a criticism, I didn't feel at any point like I was at risk of losing any crewmates loyalty, even though I did some stuff that surely would have jeopardised those relationships. For example, when aboard the Solarian Ark, I chose to save the Solarians instead of Drax, Krogan, Scout crew. Drac was mad at me, but after a while he just forgot, and his loyalty mission was doable at any point. I did it and he became loyal. It was like I never made a decision that killed his mates. This bothered me. In fact, it made me think, is this game actually giving me choices that I can make, or is it just the illusion of a choice? Sure, I can choose stuff, but the impact long term is non-existent. I'm sure we'll get into more on that shortly, but for now, on the characters front, there's a lot to like here, but unfortunately there's also a lot to be desired. The whole point of Mass Effect Andromeda is settling the Milky Way races in a new galaxy, completely unexplored to us. This means we're responsible for establishing new settlements on various planets across the Helios Cluster. We do just this. In order to establish new settlements, we need to make planets livable. They usually have some form of biohazard present that you can conveniently enter a remnant vault to fix, and some pressing struggle with raiders or ket. As we do little bits and pieces on the planet, the viability rating goes up as a form of a percentage. Once you reach a certain threat, threshold, you can settle the planet. And frankly, this isn't the most fun system ever. Once you've established the outpost, you can choose who to prioritise at it. And then you can, through points that you unlock for some reason, bring certain specialists out of cryo. The only noticeable effect of that is it may make everywhere look a little bit more populated. The first time around, this establishing a settlement routine was rather fun, but the other times it got a bit dull. There are some side quests you can do on the planets in question to improve viability as well. It's fair to say these kept it interesting enough for me to be content with with doing it, but after a while, the overall system just numbs the brain. Once the settlements are established, I can recall no fascinating side quests, just setting up satellites and the occasional firefight. This was, however, a fun idea by Bioware that was certainly not done justice in execution. It has its moments, but it doesn't keep that consistent. Once I'd settled EOS as part of the main story as an introduction to the system, I'd felt like I'd done it all a feeling reinforced when I embarked on the quest to settle the other planets. Furthermore, once these settlements are established, new characters of interest that typically follow that sort of concept were few and far between, the only guy I can remember being some chap on EOS who functioned as the outpost's mayor. The system, while fun in concept, was underwhelming to say the least. To further establish ourselves in the Andromeda Galaxy, we also need to find the Arcs for the Solarians, Asaru, and the Turians. This little mystery, where did these Arcs carrying all these people go, is quite fascinating and we find them over the course of the game. If I recall correctly, the Solarian Arc is a part of the story, whereas the Asari and Turian Arcs we have to go out of our way to locate, with the Asari Arc winding up being a part of Korra's loyalty mission. The shame with the Arcs is, while it's fascinating to fathom where these Arcs could have possibly gone, once you're aboard them they start to feel quite samey. Furthermore, the Quarian Arc, which is carrying a few of the other races, is missing, so we don't get to see any Quarians, any Hanar, any Drell, any Elcor, any Batarians or Vorcher in this game. All we get is a distress beacon at the end that tells us to stay away. Fans speculated it could have something to do with an upcoming DLC, however in 2020 I think it's safe to assume that Andromeda isn't getting any of those. The story of the Quarian Arc is published in the tie-in book Mass Effect Annihilation, however I don't play a video game to then have to go into the transmedia to get a full explanation for something. It is a massive shame that Mass Effect Andromeda is missing a huge chunk of the Milky Way races. As a result, no matter how much settling we do, Andromeda never feels complete. The main antagonists of this game are called the Ket. Yes, I know. 
They're named after horse tranquilizer. When compared to the Reapers, they're a huge downgrade from the stakes, gravitas, and mystery. There's no ambiguity surrounding them, they're just flat, boring alien race villains that exist purely for the sake of evil. And honestly, the lack of nuance among other factors make them simply ridiculous. Especially considering they're filling a void in the wake of antagonists that had the goal of destroying all advanced life in the Milky Way, in which the mystery surrounding what they were exactly was both terrifying and fascinating. By comparison, the Keta one dimensional as fuck. I understand that the Reapers are a colossal antagonist that was always going to be hard to follow up on, but the Kets simply don't even come close to the weight carried by the franchise's previous antagonists. I never felt any impact from the Ket, they were just there. It's like Bioware realised they could never create an antagonist as awesome and powerful as the Reapers again and decided not to bother. In fact, I'd more easily compare the Ket to the Groks from Spore than I ever would the Reapers. At no point in the story did I feel beaten by them, overwhelmed, like they had the upper hand. I never felt like the Ket were anything more than cannon fodder that would just get obliterated whenever I encountered them. Naturally, they used a process called Exaltation to turn other races into Ket, which is supposed to terrify me, but after the Reapers, which could indoctrinate literally anyone, this thing in itself I feel like we've seen done before, but better in the same franchise no less. To add to that, I never felt like the Exaltation process was a threat to me or any of the characters that I met, it just seemed to be a risk for random red shirt characters where they'd be turned into Ket Abominations, specifically and actually only a few Krogan. I despise when a villain exists purely for the sake of evil, and that's exactly how I felt with the Ket. Everything about the Ket is plain and simple boring, from what they're doing, their goals, their objectives, what they can do, to their fucking name. And as a result, the narrative of Mass Effect Andromeda and frankly the entire game just simply plummets in quality. To put it kindly, the Ket are just laughably bad. And by the looks of it, if there were to be an Andromeda sequel, they would continue to be the antagonists. To which I say, really? We defeated them, but they're like cockroaches. Great. Our antagonists are cockroaches. I'm so terrified of the cockroach people. I am very much so quaking in my boots. How terrifying. We know that Bioware can do better than this. Quest design for side content in Mass Effect Andromeda is nothing short of horribly executed. I'm not on about main story missions so much as there are standouts, but side content is poor to say the very least. Allow me to explain why. Firstly, a lot of side content in this game takes on the go here, do this, go here, do that structure. The linear mission structure of the trilogy has gone in favour of planets you can land on being open world areas. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, but you'll notice a ton of quests that'll have you navigate across the Helios cluster for one objective that may or may not be checklist only for you to then have to go somewhere else. This wouldn't be so annoying if there weren't lengthy animations between being on one planet and another. First you'll have the cutscene leaving one planet, then you'll go to your galaxy map and select the star system you want to go to, another unskippable animation. Then you select the planet you want to visit which is a skippable animation from about halfway through but I'll take it, and then you have a cutscene of landing. These animations are cool if you didn't have to witness them thousands of times on a single playthrough. This plays into the big floor in quest design quite a lot, I can't imagine a world in which spending most of your time in between completing quest objectives in a video game stuck in animations you've already seen a dozen times in the past hour is riveting gameplay. There's also a ton of repetition in quests as well, a lot of stuff you find yourself doing all the time. This goes from shootouts, which take up a lot of gameplay, but they're quite fun to their credit, to scanning every which thing, speaking to characters who don't have much to say, and puzzles which you'd think in Andromeda would be something new and interesting, but it's essentially Sudoku. Space Sudoku. Bloody Sudoku! We're 2.5 million light years away from home, and magically the resident ancient aliens knew what Sudoku was? <laughs> Okay. There are also a few navigational puzzles in Remnant Ruins, but they feel like a bit of a chore. On top of this, once you've done one Remnant Ruin, you feel like you've done them all as they all sort of blur into each other. Traversing landscapes in the Nomad is great fun. It's like the Mako from Mass Effect 1, but less floaty and, well, shit. The Mako in 1 was pretty rough on the controls to the point of comedy. The Nomad feels weighted, responsive, and you have to change the mode your vehicle is in on different terrain types, which is a very clever way to keep a simple gameplay mechanic somewhat engaging. Open world areas have a lot of open space in which there's not very much going on, so the Nomad is a necessary addition to the game, and you'll find yourself using it a lot as a result. I like bouncing about in the Nomad, hearing your crew talk about whatever they're talking about. It makes travelling empty world spaces quite bearable. You can also be extracted by the tempest 
purpose straight from the Nomad, which is a cool feature, and stops you wasting time having to return all the way back to your ship. In the side content, you'll find yourself being taken across the Helios cluster running errands and doing investigations, but the best the side content has to offer has to be the loyalty missions, which are pretty damn decent. But it's just a shame that the vast majority of stuff that you'll be doing as side content in this game is really quite dull, simple, and uninteresting. But I will say that side content is better tracked in this game than it was in the trilogy, and if the game's quality gave me an incentive to do more of it, then I would be really happy. An RPG should thrive on its side content as well, and unfortunately Mass Effect Andromeda doesn't really do that. Technically establishing outposts on planets is also a part of the side content for the most part, and I've already gone over what I think about that, so I won't rehash my words. And engaging with your crew aboard the Tempest is also technically side content, so it's not all terrible, however it's certainly far from consistent. This is an area that Bioware could look to improve in the future. I've already gone over quite a few elements of Mass Effect Andromeda's story in this video, so I'll try to keep this segment as short as possible, but Mass Effect Andromeda's story falls flat in quite a lot of ways. The father-child dynamic that makes the intro so interesting is thrown away. As we mentioned, the Ket aren't the best antagonists. The entire point of the narrative is to function as a cop-out to avoid the plot responsibilities left behind by the trilogy. A lot of the new Andromeda lore just does not feel that interesting. Andromeda feels empty and lonely, and the entire story gets warped into a massive MacGuffin chase, with this Meridian plot device which essentially functions as a place where you can terraform worlds to be habitable by life and is also conveniently powerful enough to stage galactic domination. And without the Quarian arc, the world building feels incomplete and as a result the story does too. Also, your decisions in dialogue and otherwise don't seem to have an impact outside of the immediate situation. And with a lack of morality in dialogue, everything feels on rails. And establishing outposts and settlements is side content as opposed to a part of the main story which is what you'd expect it to be. The narrative isn't as strong, especially not when compared to the trilogy. It's not all terrible however as your crew is great fun to explore with, and Ryder is also a decent protagonist, but I guess it is somewhat subjective when I say that for me at least the narrative fails to please because there's so much bog that's just holding it back. It's not the worst story I've ever experienced by a mile, and when I put the trilogy from my mind it becomes even more enjoyable, but I can't do that because it is still Mass Effect. There's a lot of potential in the concept of exploring a brand new galaxy, but I don't think this game realises that in a story that feels at times like it's just a rehash of something we've already seen. I guess what I'm trying to say is that this, though it is on paper a new adventure, didn't feel especially new. Even when you think something interesting is about to happen, it usually winds up being nothing. Either because we've seen it before, or it was just not delivered too well. And with a limited quality side content to fill the gaps, you notice it. But I guess that summary tells you where my head's at with the story of this game. Here we go. Andromeda, despite all the patches, is still a fairly buggy game. From necks twisting unnaturally to catching the nomad tugging itself off, the eyes and teeth of characters being prominent in the scanner even if the characters in question don't have those kinds of teeth. Certain faces still look clapped to oblivion, and then you have characters zooming off after dialogue interactions like they're dying for a shit. And of course, who could forget this infamous, terrifying, bold nexus bar stage lady who just stands there forever, twitching occasionally like she's in some sort of horror movie. There's more to life than this. This game is far from a polished experience, however I think it's fair to say what we'll experience now pales in comparison to what we would have experienced back in 2017. That doesn't make the bugs that are still present any less hilarious, but in the end of the day, you're always going to get bugs in every single game going. It's essentially a part of the experience, and if there's nothing else to say about Andromeda, at least you'll get a good kick out of the bugs. Of course, the largest, most standout flaw in the entirety of Mass Effect Andromeda is how disconnected it feels from what Mass Effect is. There's no real immersion to be had in Andromeda, the game feels like a game, the trilogy felt like an authentic universe. I understand that's a difficult point to argue based on the fact that what counts as what depends entirely on what your taste is and thus I feel pretentious for even saying it, but that's how I felt. I've mentioned the shit antagonist that pales in comparison to the Reapers and the complete lack of a Paragon slash Renegade system, but another thing that sacrifices what Mass Effect feels like is the world design. A small handful of open world areas that you can visit instead of loads of different planets with linear areas that you can 
visit inside missions. While it gives us more to do when it comes to endgame content, it makes the galaxy we're experiencing feel smaller as opposed to bigger. And when the vast majority of these open world areas are completely without anything interesting going on, is it worth it? No. Also, Andromeda did not give me that warm fuzzy feeling as I soaked in the lore. It felt cold and lonely and made me hyper aware of every single flaw and unrealistic plot point. Furthermore, the trilogy thrived on its world building. Andromeda does try to piggyback on that at times, but keeps everything that happened at arm's length as a means to avoid having to go into too much detail about the state of the Milky Way. The Milky Way in the trilogy felt like home this game makes me feel homesick. I appreciate the concept of going to Andromeda and it isn't bad. I just don't think it was delivered in a way that embodied Mass Effect. The Mass Effect magic is gone and this game does try to replicate it but it just can't. I hope my point is making sense because I'm not saying this to be hateful because I can appreciate what this game is and what it does in fact do. When you're playing it with the trilogy out of your mind it's a rather enjoyable experience but the moment you remember it you just feel empty. Or at least that's how I felt. The first time I played through Mass Effect Andromeda I felt like it was a franchise killer. I don't think it was fair of me to think that because on my second playthrough I realised that it didn't really kill anything. My love for the Mass Effect brand is still alive. This second playthrough has given me some perspective. I didn't love Andromeda, but I didn't hate it. There are some things that it did well, there are other things that it did poorly. I know what you're thinking, what's the point in this video? Is it relevant? The game's three years old. Well, to that I say it's still the latest Mass Effect game, so I think it is somewhat relevant. This is a game full of lessons to be learnt by Bioware. With the next Mass Effect title reportedly in very early development, I think it's important that they address some of the things they didn't quite get right in this game, and I hope that whatever comes next will be better for it. Half my issue is I perhaps love the Mass Effect trilogy far too much, but replaying Andromeda has also left me feeling somewhat optimistic. The franchise isn't in shambles, not by a mile. It can still be corrected and put back on the path of quality. It may never live up to the trilogy, but it may also surpass it. But whatever comes next, Andromeda is a part of that journey now. Will the next game be a sequel to that, or will it be something new again? That's a question that only Bioware can answer. All I know is what I'm feeling, and what I'm feeling is that Mass Effect isn't done yet. Thank you.